Saudara pengurusi, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> I'm, I've been asked to speak to you on a very difficult subject. Human capital development, a global perspective. I say very difficult because I belong to the old school, not to the modern social sciences. And being of the old school, I retain a great deal of what I was taught in school. <clears throat> In school, my teachers told us, don't be a slave to the printed word. And then we also have many other instructions, you may call the instructions plays in our minds. Among them, words are not deeds. So don't be impressed by words. You have to understand above all what each word, each term, each concept, each sentence, means. So when we speak of human capital, the modern generation is very impressed when you use terms like human capital. We must produce human capital. And then uh, in the universities, we are often told, uh, we want universities in this country to be world class. What is a world-class university? So far, from what I have been exposed to in the present era, world-class means the universities must all observe ISO. You know what ISO means? The way it is interpreted in the university? In each department, all the walls must be painted of the same color. All the furniture must be of the same type. And everything must be quantified. You cannot do things differently. In other words, there must be uniformity. But to my own mind, uniformity is not creativity. If all you do is to quote other people, and that's what modern scholars do. They quote scholars mainly from the West. So where do you find the invention of ideas in the West? So much so that even Asian scholars writing about Asia take instructions from Western scholars. This I cannot do. I refuse to do. I tell Western scholars, I know Malaysia better than you. I will explain Malaysia to you my way. 
I'm not going to explain Malaysia the way you see it. But believe it or not, it is a very difficult hurdle for me. Because the academic world is controlled by the West. So if you want to publish something in the West, your work will be sent to Western scholars for evaluation. And anything that they don't understand, they say is incorrect. So in the end, you will end up writing nothing more than what they have already said. And they're very clever. The Western mind is very cunning. See, in sports, when they cannot beat, beat you, they will change the rules. They've changed the rules of hockey. Today, India and Pakistan are nowhere compared to Holland, Australia. They've changed the rules. In badminton, they're trying to change the rules. They've not quite succeeded. So, in terms of academic writings, they tell us, you see, a country like Malaysia is very complex. To understand Malaysia, you must understand it, the rest of Asia first. So they are saying, they are telling us, no, 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 we don't want you to give us the trees. Tell us the wood. Otherwise, we will not see the wood for the trees. They say. I tell them, without the trees, there can be no wood. Malaysian society is complex. You want to understand Malaysia? You understand every aspect of it. Not just the macro, the micro as well. If you cannot cope, that's your problem. <laughs> because I can. Malaysia is very, very interesting country. Full of challenges. And I'm afraid Malaysians themselves don't understand Malaysia. Although we have many slogans. Eh? Malaysia truly Asia. What is the meaning? I've asked so many Malaysians, what is the meaning? They don't know. They only know the slogan. Uh, that's how our students score A's in their exams. They always repeat what they have been you cannot be world class that way. The whole idea of invention is new to Malaysians. So if you want to produce human capital, and I don't see why you must use the term human capital. <laughs> In my days again, they, they would say, call a spade a spade, and not an instrument of manual husbandry. <laughs> but today, if you call a spade a spade, they say, no, that's very ordinary. So you must call it an instrument of manual husbandry. Then people are very impressed because they, are, they don't understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. See, my younger days, if you fail to make yourself understood when you're writing or speaking, then you will de deem a failure. But today, I've heard this comment in Singapore after attending a talk by an American. We all came out of the hall and one person said, my God, he was so brilliant. I didn't understand a word of what he said. <laughs> So that's how you become brilliant today. <laughs> so Malaysia has a long way to go. Many who are very forthright, not trying to hide behind this and that, have made some very interesting comments. In fact, this was a politician, you know, 
who went abroad went to some not so uh, advanced countries take for example India where the in infrastructure is poor, very poor so he came back he said if you compare Malaysia with India, you find that in India, infrastructure-wise, it is very backward. But the mentality is first class. That's why Indian institutes of technology are world class. But if you have never been to India, and before you go, you begin to imagine India as a very advanced country, you, you'll be very disappointed. It's like a third world country that has not improved physically. But the people think a lot, invent a lot. They have invented the cheapest car in the world. But Malaysia, Malaysia has everything. So this politician friend of mine said, Malaysians, Malaysia has first-class infrastructure, but third-class mentality. Because Malaysians don't think. That was my experience throughout in a university. I originally, when I first started, I did what other lecturers did. So I would prepare my lectures, then I would read them out slowly. And two or three years later, I found that my first year lectures were being sold. There were students who knew shorthand, who took down everything, printed and sold them. I was surprised because one day when I was reading my lectures, I found that the students were also following me. I said, well, what are you looking at? They took the text from them, my lectures. I said, this will not do. I want you to think, not memorize. So from that day onwards, I refused to read out lecture notes. And I began to speak like this. As the years went by, I became very unpopular. <laughs> because they were lost without a text. And I told them, to get A from me, you must give me unusual answers. Whereas every year, when I was marking papers, it was terribly boring because I was marking my own answers. <laughs> <laughs> and naturally, I became very unpopular. And today, the situation is very bad because we want to follow the Americans. So the universities now ask students to evaluate their lecturers. God forbid. That's what they did. One of my lecturers who came back from Oxford did his best to enlighten the students, make them think. So he asked a lot of questions during lectures. The evaluation from some of the students was the lecturer's knowledge is very poor. 
because he was not feeding them with facts. So, the Prime Minister has said that he wanted Malaysian universities to be world class. We must produce Nobel laureates, we must produce professors who are as good as the professors in the Ivy League universities. I agree with all that, but what is happening in the university? The people who put leaders in the universities pick them not according to their ability to lead, to lead universities towards, I think I should not use the word academic too much, huh? towards intellectual excellence. Academic excellence in Malaysia is unfortunately misunderstood. It simply means you must score A's in examinations. That is what the Chinese in the past used to do. To be a Mandarin, you must take an examination where you regurgitate all the time. So much so that some of these young people who had to prepare for the exams in those days, especially under Manchu rule, the Chinese male also used to have long hair. So they would tie their hair to the ceiling. So in case they fell asleep, that would be a joke. <laughs> so they could continue to memorize. And believe it or not, Chinese school students in this country continue to memorize. That's why they perform very well in examinations. And if you don't know how well they can memorize, I tell you this, I had classmates who came from Chinese schools to learn English. They memorized the Oxford Pocket Dictionary. And today, they can still do that. You give them a passage of 20 pages to read and prepare, then you would question them. They would memorize every comma, every full stop. And they would answer exactly from there. But the mind would not be able to invent, you see. You see, it is, the mind would be confined to what has been learned by rote. You cannot expect them to do things differently. And science tends to encourage that kind of thing. I'm not saying that scientists are not inventive. They can be, provided they realize that nothing is forever. So you try to improve on it. But on the whole, in science, you need to remember, unlike in the humanities, where you are expected to look at things from your own point of view and then express what you have in mind. So we're telling the government again and again, separate the humanities from the sciences. Have different teams to lead our scholars, but they don't do that. To the government, to the Malaysian public as a whole, the science person is superior. So they run the universities today, most of the time. They make decisions for everybody. And when our projects go up for evaluation, they evaluate when they don't understand, you see. They just don't understand 
what we're doing. History is of no value, they said. Because you cannot predict. Because also you cannot be employed if you do history. But believe it or not, it is not my history students who are unemployed. The unemployed students, graduates, are mostly the science graduates. Because their ability is confined to very narrow fields. What can a physics graduate do apart from teaching physics and doing research in physics? Is he suitable to become the Inspector General of Police? His perspective is very narrow. Whereas my former students have been employed all over the place. The customs, in banks, in politics, of course. Most of the, many of the political leaders were my students. And some of the very naughty ones were my history students. <laughs> Why are they naughty? Because the mind is always doing somersaults. <laughs> I won't mention the names, but they're so naughty that my own children used to tell me something must be wrong with you, you see, to produce students like that. You see. But their minds are very alert. The fact that they misapply their intelligence is a different matter. Therefore, you must, at the same time, instill good values. It's not enough to produce people who can perform well in whatever they do. They, have, they need to have integrity. You can have the best political system in the world, but if the people who man that system lack integrity, then the system will not work. Look at Thailand today, the mess it is in, absolute mess. Practically a whole country protested against the present government forcing the airports to close down and so on. And their hero is a fellow who made millions and millions from that country. But he was very cunning. He made a lot of money, but he used a lot of the money to help the poor. So the poor support him. So he was a Robin Hood. But does that make it right for him to exploit his country? So you need to have good values. Integrity is not something irrelevant in a world where knowledge is considered so superior. What makes a man an acceptable man. We don't use the word good nowadays because everybody will ask you, what do you mean by good? Good is something positive. You say he's a good man. That means you have many positive things to say about him. Because he does things the right way. Then you will say, what is the right way? See, all this we do in philosophy, you know. So much so that the government is very afraid that Malaysians may think like that. So when the University of Malaya moved to Kuala Lumpur, the Department of Philosophy was dropped. So in the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, there is no philosophy department. In all the universities in Malaysia, there is no Department of Philosophy. Uh, people don't understand what philosophy is all about. Philosophy, of course, can be about a number of things. It used to be defined as either a, res a recipe for life, 
when you're talking about Buddhism, for example, you know, there's a philosophy of Buddhism. It is also about analysis. In philosophy, analysis is very important. Or it can, can be both. But the important thing is, when you say something, when you use a word, when you use a concept, when you use a term, it must be clear what you mean. But that is not enough, as I said. Then do you practice what you preach? That's very important. I think in this country, we see too much of people who say something and do something else. So whether a person, a leader, practices what he preaches is very important. What I'm trying to say is it is not enough to say that you want a certain thing done positively. Yeah. What do you mean by positively? If you were a hospital assistant, yeah, what should you do? You should, above all, be concerned for the people that you have to look after. I was in Singapore lately, and somebody told me a very interesting story. He is a retired hospital assistant from Singapore. So one day when he was visiting his daughter, I think in Melbourne, Australia, and he was basically always very fit. He exercised and was very particular about so many things. One day he was out walking as part of his exercise. He suddenly felt very unwell. And being, of course, a medical person, he knew what to do. He didn't push himself. So he just sat down and then he lay down on the field. And then a lady from another country passed by, saw him and asked him, are you all right? He explained that he was feeling very unusual. And he thought he could be suffering from hypo. So he told the lady, it could be hypo. So she quickly phoned her husband, who also was a trained person in medicine, and the man brought sugar down to feed him. But he didn't get well. So they decided to send for an ambulance. So he was taken to hospital. And the doctor looked at him and told him that you have had a heart attack. And the only way to deal with it was to operate on him. Now he did everything and everything was finished. So I asked him, I said, when you were brought to the hospital, did they ask you how you were going to pay? He said, they never did. They asked me how I was going to pay only after the operation and after I had become well. This is the difference between hospitals in Australia and hospitals here in Malaysia. In Malaysia, the moment you are taken in, they want to know, how are you going to pay? And if you cannot explain how you're going to pay, they turn you away. They turn you away. The private hospitals are worse than the government hospitals. In the case of the government hospitals, they may not turn you away, but they'll make you wait, you see. <laughs> and it's a very long wait, even though you are dying. But in Australia, they never mention payment 
until the man had been fully treated. That is what you call integrity. Because if you are a doctor or a dresser, your main function, your main role, your main duty is to help those who need medical attention. In Malaysia, unfortunately, we think of medicine as the best way to make money. So in Malaysia, medicine as a profession ranks very high. At first, it started with the Indians and the Salonis. To them, a doctor is a special human being. Parents who have daughters will try the best to get sons-in-law who are doctors. And they're very proud. Salonis especially. I've heard old Salonis men say, my daughter is a doctor, my son is a doctor, my son-in-law is a doctor, my daughter-in-law is a doctor. So we say to the Salonis community, to go to heaven, you must first be a doctor. And you'll be surprised how much of their, the money you know, the Salonis are very good for saving money because they used to buy land. There was a time when Jalan Tuanku Abdraman and Jalan Ipo, the land around there, most of it was owned by Salonis. But they have sold out because they would pay for the education of their children. And education means only medicine is important. So many of them used to send them to India where they have to pay capitation fees which rose from 10, 20,000 to maybe 200,000. Yeah. And they pay dowries, you see? The poor Sloanese parents. If they have daughters, if the daughters are beautiful, there is a chance the man, uh, the, the men that they want to marry may compromise, you see? Uh, but if they're doctors, they will not compromise. And the dowry can be as high as two, three million, you know. Some of these uh, men who cannot go and study on their own would choose uh, women who are very rich. You see? Then the father-in-law will send them to go and study. So doctors, uh, today, of course, Malay, Chinese, all rank doctors very high. Why? Because they believe that doctors make a lot of money. I used to tell them, but what I say does not impress them. I say, you look at the Chinese community, look at them. The rich Chinese in this country mostly had very little education. Uh, and I always compare myself to the late Lim Gotong. Say, I have four degrees. Say, I can't afford to have lunch in Mandarin Oriental every day. But Lim Gotong could have bought Mandarin Oriental. And Lim Gotong studied only in a primary school in China. That's all. So if you want to learn how to make money, go and learn from people like that. Don't come to the university. The professors there cannot help you. <laughs> Not even professors of economics. Eh? Professors of economics very often, tumberang only. <laughs> yeah. One of them tried to insult me one day, you know. He said, oh, you know, history is like driving a car by looking at the rear mirror all the time. <laughs> so I told him, I said, economics is like driving a car in pitch darkness with only the parking lights. <laughs> Economists always claim they can predict, but they can't. Look at the number of recessions that have occurred in human history. When have they correctly predicted these recessions? 
And at this moment, do they really know what to do? They don't. Because economics is also a speculative subject. What is the difference? When you use the word science, you have to understand what it means. In philosophy, we always explain that the essence of science is prediction. How? How do scientists predict? Because when they have a theory, they test that theory under control conditions. Then they get the results. And that result must be, can be repeated again and again. So you carry out the same test or the same experiment and if, continue, if you continue to get the same result, then you are sure that theory is right. But if you use a theory in sociology or economics, there is no way you can test it under control conditions. That means your result is speculative. If it is speculative, it is not much better than guesswork. So I give them the credit that they have parking lights. It's a little better than guesswork. But science has impressed the world so much, especially the Asian world. They want to play scientific football. I say, if you play scientific football, you'll be playing football that your opponents can read. Because your moves all will be worked out, you see, beforehand. A must pass to B, B must pass to C, like that, you know. And the worst thing is that when A has to pass to B, he doesn't notice that B is covered already, you see. So he passes the ball and the ball is taken away. Not thinking. I say, you must play creative football. And if you don't know what creative football means, you go and look for the video clip showing Maradona in one of the World Cups dribbling, dribbling past almost the entire English defense, including the goalkeeper. That is creative football. And they're very proud. Solanese especially. I've heard old Solanese men say, my daughter is a doctor, my son is a doctor, my son-in-law is a doctor, my daughter-in-law is a doctor. So we say to the Solanese community, to go to heaven, you must first be a doctor. <laughs> and you'll be surprised how much of the, the money, you know, the Solanese are very good for saving money because they used to buy land. There was a time when Jalan Tuanku Abdraman and Jalan Ipo, the land around there, most of it was owned by Slonis. But they have sold out because they would pay for the education of their children. And education means only medicine is important. So many of them used to send them to India where they have to pay capitation fees, which rose from 10, 20,000 to maybe 200,000. Yeah. And they pay dowries, you see? The poor Sloanese parents. If they have daughters, if the daughters are beautiful, there is a chance the men, uh, the, the men that they want to marry may compromise. You see? Uh, but if they're doctors, they will not compromise. And the dowry can be as high as two, three million, you know? Some of these um, men who cannot go and study on their own would choose uh, women who are very rich, you see? Then the father-in-law will send them to go and study. So doctors, uh, today, of course, Malay, Chinese, all rank doctors very high. Why? Because they believe that doctors make a lot of money. I used to tell them, but what I say does not impress them. I say, you look at the Chinese community, look at them. The rich Chinese in this country 
mostly had very little education. Uh, and I always compare myself to the late Lim Gotong. Say, I have four degrees. Say, I can't afford to have lunch in Mandarin Oriental every day. But Lim Gotong could have bought Mandarin Oriental. And Lim Gotong studied only in a primary school in China. That's all. So if you want to learn how to make money, go and learn from people like that. Don't come to the university. The professors there cannot help you. <laughs> Not even professors of economics. Eh? Professors of economics very often tembarang only. <laughs> yeah. One of them tried to insult me one day, you know. He said, oh, you know, history is like driving a car by looking at the rear mirror all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him, I said, economics is like driving a car in pitch darkness with only the parking lights. <laughs> Economists always claim they can predict, but they can't. Look at the number of recessions that have occurred in human history. When have they correctly predicted these recessions? And at this moment, do they really know what to do? They don't. Because economics is also a speculative subject. What is the difference? When you use the word science, you have to understand what it means. In philosophy, we always explain that the essence of science is prediction. How? How do scientists predict? Because when they have a theory, they test that theory under control conditions. Then they get the results. And that result must be can be repeated again and again. So you carry out the same test or the same experiment, and if you continue, if you continue to get the same result, then you are sure that theory is right. But if you use a theory in sociology or economics, there is no way you can test it under control conditions. That means your result is speculative. If it is speculative, it is not much better than guesswork. So I give them the credit that they have parking lights. It's a little better than guesswork. But science has impressed the world so much, especially the Asian world. They want to play scientific football. I say, if you play scientific football, you'll be playing football that your opponents can read. Because your moves all will be worked out, you see, beforehand. A must pass to B, B must pass to C, like that, you know. And the worst thing is that when A has to pass to B, he doesn't notice that B is covered already, you see. So he passes the ball and the ball is taken away. Not thinking. You must play creative football. If you don't know what creative football means, you go and look for the video clip showing Maradona in one of the World Cups dribbling, dribbling past almost the entire English defense, including the goalkeeper. That is creative football. When you bamboozle your opponents, keep them guessing. That is creative football. So creativity means you are not the right, like the rest of men. And if you want to produce human capital, <laughs> you must produce people like that. Not people who are predictable, who can adjust themselves in various situations 
the idea always is to try to produce something better than others. Which means that you have to know what is happening in other places, in other parts of the world. You want to talk about India? Go there. You must go there. There's no point reading about India from here. It's not the same. I've been told that Singaporeans, when they go to India, suffer from culture shock. Because Singapore is a very orderly society. Everything is tip-top. All according to the law. Very predictable, Singapore. In India, my God, you see. If you drive in India, you see, the beautiful thing about India is that although the traffic is chaotic, no? practically no laws, you know, you just go here, go there, no accident. <laughs> because the people are so used to maneuvering, you know? <laughs> yeah. I there was one occasion when I was in a taxi, and the opposite taxi were coming. I say, finish, 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 finish. <laughs> but at the last moment, they could avoid each other. <laughs> Even the cow, cow coming up. So it looked like my taxi was going to knock that cow, but at the last moment, the cow turned his head. <laughs> it, is an, it is a beautiful experience to be in India. And I didn't even go to Calcutta, which I am told is even more amazing. But you can see that human being, sometimes in adverse conditions, can function at the best. Because the mind, the mind can adjust to different situations. But here, we are sometimes too law abiding. So much so that when these motor, motorcyclists do funny things, accident occur. So it is not true that there can be no order in chaos. It can be. And uh, if you really want to produce human beings who can excel all the time, then you have to know what's happening in other places. Don't be a kata to bawa tempurung. Sometimes we are too confident of ourselves. We think we are as good as anybody else. Uh, but you don't realize what's going on. And I'm personally, personally I'm shocked also that today even the third university in Hong Kong has outranked the University of Malaya. It's very sad for me. The University of Malaya was once a brand name. It was a world-class university. I will tell you the story of, about how the University of Malaya came into being. Before the war, there was King Edward VII Medical College and later on, Raffles College. Then, during the war, the British decided that it was time they withdrew from this country. So they, have, they had to prepare the people of this country to take over. So it was, the country needed a university. So it would be quite easy they felt if the King Edward VII College and Raffles College were to merge and became a university. So the Carl Saunders Commission was set up. So the commission met, but they were not sure whether the King Edward VII and Raffles had reached that stage where by combining they could become a university. So while they were in England, they felt that perhaps 
these two should combine to become first a university college. Mm -hmm. And the university college can gradually achieve university, full university status. So they came to Singapore and there was a dinner one night when they were introduced to graduates from Medical College at Raffles College. And believe it or not, in the course of discussions and so on, conversation, that night itself, the commission, commission was so impressed by the graduates of these colleges that they decided on the spot during dinner that King Edward and Raffles would become a full-fledged university. We produce world-class scholars. And our students too, our schools produce excellent scholars. They were so successful in Cambridge, in Oxford. That was the standard. But today, to have Chula Long Kong beat us, Chula Long Kong never spoke English at one time. The third university in Hong Kong. Yes. Nanyang Technological University beat us. I was a fellow in Nanyang several years ago. Nothing very unusual about the place. But unless we take what we do seriously and be aware of what is happening in the rest, rest of the world, if we just put our heads in the ground and think that everybody can see us, we will never be there. You must never be afraid to compete. I'm competitive because of sports. I played a lot of football. And during our days, we were not like other school children because the principal, the brother director, my school was St. Michael's Institution, Ipo, was very good. He allowed us to play in the Ipo League, representing a club. And that way we progressed faster than others. So when we played against other schools, we just walked over them. Poor Anderson School got 10 goals from us. And Sultan Yusuf Batu Gajah got 14 goals from us. And we beat uh, this, this was too good to be true. Huh? We beat the top army site in the country in 1956. Not the Malay Regiment, the Royal Scots Fusiliers. They had junior Scottish international and so on. We beat them. So when I came to this university, later on as a tutor, we formed a football team among the staff. And we beat the students. See, we, those days in sports, always went for the gold medal, not silver medal. What more? Bronze medal. Gold medal. We were competitive. So whether in sports or in whatever that I do, I have become competitive. So when I first became a tutor in the history department, the history department was vibrant. Lots of foreigners came to do their masters or to do research. Even the Ohio University, Green Bay, they used to send the students every year. So I taught American students. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed teaching American students because we would then sit, we would sit in a, in a circle. You know? and then we would talk. And as I talk, they would ask questions from time to time. Okay? Not like our students. They keep quiet. And then at the end of it, you ask them, any question? They put their heads down. <laughs> And in one examination, I remember, 
the girl was asked, we, we, I asked them to discuss Malaysian society. So she was discussing, and then halfway she got stuck. Our students would say something which is irrelevant or what. She got stuck. She wrote that. She wrote in the examination paper. Heck, why is this so complicated? So forthright. So forthright. So I didn't penalize her. Other lecturers may penalize a student for doing that. On the contrary, you know what some of our students do? They would beg. Oh, my parents are very poor. They borrow money to send me to universities. So please pass me. <laughs> Not forthright. Eh? Not sincere. Not really aiming at achieving the best results. So, if you're talking about human capital, uh, now every term, every word, every concept can have two separate meanings. One we call connotation. Connotation. What does it mean? Strictly speaking, what does it mean? The other one is connotation. What does it suggest? That's also important. What does it suggest? If you call somebody, if you call a boy a boy, that's it. He's a boy. Finish. But if you call him a brat, a brat is also a boy. You see? But you have added something there. You don't like him. In your eyes, he is a naughty fellow, troublesome fellow. So, human capital, its connotation is simply person or a group of persons, or workers, who are properly trained, who have the right skills, and so on. But it is not enough to say that you want the kind of people. How are you going to produce them? If your methods go wrong, like in our universities today, our education system in general, you will not get the products you want. See, we also say, oh, to achieve national unity, our students must be taught a lot about Malaysia. And now they're bringing history back into primary schools. So after killing the subject, now they bring it back. I have seen some history textbooks. They are horrible. In the first place, the syllabus was done by people who didn't understand Malaysian history. And then the writers were also people who didn't understand Malaysian history. You know how they get it? They managed to get in? These little Napoleons. Eh? You know the phrase now, little Napoleons? In a lot of government departments, there are people who, have, who are very powerful. Eh? Sometimes they can be even chief clerks. Eh? Very powerful. They make the decision. In the university, for example, they have this section called human resource, eh? full of little Napoleons. Very powerful people. Yeah. Sometimes they don't like you. They will sabotage you, you know. If you are called for a promotion exercise, very often, if they want to frustrate you, they send your letter calling for interview late, so that you won't turn up, you see. <laughs> and one day, one poor young lecturer was due for confirmation. She was temporary and then due for confirmation. One morning, she got a call. Not from the dean, not from the deputy vice chancellor, but from somebody in human resource. You cannot be confirmed, the person said, because you have published internationally 
but you have not published nationally. <laughs> if you have published internationally, you have published nationally. But if you have published nationally, then you have not published internationally. It's the other way around. But, you see, these little Napoleons are so powerful. And these little Napoleons are also involved in writing anonymous letters. When they don't like a particular dean, they join in, you know, signing signature, saying they don't want that dean. That is the culture in the university today. How can you produce people that will be able to help the country achieve progress and fame? And everything is very quantitative. Ten articles are better than one article. That's not the way the academic world used to work. If you write ten articles, but you have merely taken ideas from various people, and I write one, one article, but the ideas are entirely my own, and I challenge the existing ideas which are current at the international level, then my article is better than those 10 articles that have produced nothing new. But our present leadership does not understand that. So you have this ISO nonsense. And they have auditing nowadays, you know. Audit, they will audit each department. So when various lecturers will be picked from time to time to audit. So one day one poor head of department was being audited. And this young auditor told him, say, I'm afraid you have neglected the fire extinguisher. Is it the duty of the head of an academic department to look after the fire extinguisher? But ISO would include the fire extinguisher. So. so, before you can talk of human capital, you must talk of the ability of people to think independently. Can they think independently? So your education system in particular must produce people who can think independently. In our case, those who can think independently, unfortunately, are outnumbered by those who cannot. See, if you read the reports about universities today, they will always tell you that we are not producing people who are employable. Employable, not who are not thinking. Mm -hmm. So one day, this was three, four years ago, I asked the Minister for Higher Education. I said, why are we telling our students that it is very important for them to be able to get employment. Why don't we encourage them to be self-employed? If you're a graduate, it doesn't mean that you must be a wage earner. You can try to be self-employed. He gave me a very good answer. He said, because in Malaysia, to be self-employed is to be unemployed. So if you have a son who is self-employed, you are shy to tell your neighbors, eh? because the neighbors will then whisper, hey, his son is not employed. Eh? But if you are above all a doctor, eh? well, a doctor in this country, marvelous. If you have two, three doctors, I, I, not me, 
my wife. My wife is Jaffna. See? So her relatives are very particular about doctors. So those who have doctors in the family are very cocky. Yeah? <laughs> but they don't realize that in our society, we need more than just doctors to survive. There must be brilliant people in many fields so that whatever we do, whatever we do, we try to produce the best results possible. And the best results must be comparable to international standards. It is time, it is time for Malaysians to think internationally. Because you'll be surprised, this country was, it's never been a common country, it's never been. Even in those days, we were very well known all over. Maybe initially it was just Malacca. Right? So the West knew of Malacca. But Malacca was once said to be the busiest port in the world. And then, of course, we became the world's number one exporter of Gambia and pepper. And these people sell them here huh? in Johor. Johor began the planting of Gambia and pepper. So we became the world's number one exporter of Gambia, Gambia and pepper. At the same time, we became the world's number one exporter of tin. And then we became the world's number one exporter of rubber. And now, we are the world's number one exporter of oil palm. On top of that, we have discovered oil. Compared to Singapore, what has Singapore got? Nothing. They have nothing. They are just middlemen and they provide service. In the early 50s, among all the countries in the British Commonwealth, we contributed the highest amount of revenue to Britain in the early 50s. And our students, as I told you, you know, not so long ago, after the war, we started the teaching, teachers' college in Kirby and Brinsford. Remember? So our students used to go every year to England. One was near Liverpool, one near Birmingham. And whenever they went shopping in the town, they would speak in English. And the locals were listening. They were very curious. So they asked the students, how long have you stayed in Britain? They said, oh, one or two weeks. You know, when they newly arrived. One or two weeks and you speak English like that? See, our English was flawless. Flawless. But today, they don't get this teachers who speak flawless English to teach English. They get just anybody. Those little Napoleons again. You know, pick their friends. They pick their friends. So why did the science, teaching of science and math and English fail? Not because the pupils cannot cope. Not at all. When I was in school, the Malay medium students, after four years in Malay medium schools, the outstanding ones were then admitted to English medium schools. So they spent two years in the special Malay class. And within those two years, just two years, they could catch up with the rest. Why? Because of the teachers. See, if you get the right teachers, 
the pupils will be able to benefit. But if you pick only your friends all the time, you sabotage that system. And that is what is happening. I don't know whether the ministry is aware of that. But in case it is not, I'm telling you now. In case you are wondering why the teaching of maths and science in English has failed. But there are some politicians who say, oh, we must teach maths in mother tongue. Mother tongue. The one Chinese fellow who told me, he said, oh, teach in mother tongue because the Chinese can come faster than the Malays. Malay says satu, dua, tiga, empat. Chinese, you're a son, will you chip up? Yes, 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 yes. Chinese may be a monosyllable language. Tamil is not. But the Indians can speak faster than you. I agree. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Indians can. That's why Indians are lawyers, mostly, in this country. Yeah, yeah I'm not. There was, a, there was one occasion, I don't know whether Patronas is still doing that, when Patronas decided to interview about five candidates at the same time. The Indian students always won. They speak very fast, and they, are, they can do somersaults. Eh? <laughs> Look at the somersaults that they do in courts. Look at Lingam. <laughs> Sounds like me. Looks like me. It's not me. <laughs> and my Chinese friend from China said, oh, it's very difficult to translate that into Chinese. <laughs> So you need to use your mind as much as possible. You need to be inventive and you need to be aware of the rest of the world. Don't always copy people. If you try to match the West in science, because you are starting very late, you see, compared to them, it will take you a very long time. My friend said, for example, why are you not concentrating on tropical products? If you want to compare, compete with China in the field of industries, it's very difficult to win. They have, above all, they have manpower. They have a huge market, domestic market. You see, but if you grow tropical products, even fruits, and if you export them to China, you will be a very rich man because China cannot produce these fruits. And we can, he said, also concentrate on producing solar energy because ours is a tropical country. China cannot do the same thing to compete with us. So you pick on your strength and compete against people who are weaker. You pick on their strength when you're weaker, how are you going to beat them? So if you're talking of human capital, you should be thinking along those lines too. Not just simply copy people. Boy. Malaysia, as I say, is an amazing country. We have never really been inferior. Our scholars started going to Cambridge and Oxford since the 1880s, you know, 1880s. And before that, we used to send some people to India to study medicine. And we have talked in so many fields. There was a time when this Penang Free School boy, called Wu Lian Te, went to China, and he became the world's leading expert on plague. And if you want to study the history of the women in this country, very interesting, very, very interesting. One of our women was sent to assassinate the governor, governor in 1924. Can you imagine 1924? Another woman also from Penang was involved in the revolution in China. And he married China's wartime prime minister. 
So Malaysia is not an ordinary country. But Malaysians don't know about Malaysia. Eh? So you ask them about Malaysia. And I said, there is, there is no country in the world with two kings. Malaysia has nine kings. Why? Uh, why? My friend was hitchhiking to England during the time of the Iranian Revolution. So when he was near Iran, he met these few Iranians, scolding the king. Then he turned to my friend and said, Do you have a king in your country? My friend said, Yeah, we have nine. Even they burst out laughing. How? How did it happen? Mm -hmm. See, Malaysians don't know. I'm sure you don't know. Eh? And yet, it's a fact of life. Our monarchical system is so amazing. Yesterday, only yesterday, the Pumangku Yang Yam Tuan Besar uh, gave a talk. And he was saying how it is not right that the rulers' immun immun immunity should be taken away from them. Whereas judges have that immunity, the rulers don't have. But the rulers have a very, very big role to play in our constitutional system. Yeah? Politicians, don't listen to politicians. They simply cook up all sorts of things. Yeah? <laughs> you must go back to history to get the correct picture. And our history is amazing. Two years ago, I was in New Zealand having my breakfast, when the owner of the stall saw that I was from outside, he came near and said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Malaysia. Ah, I said, have you heard of my country, Macedonia and Alexander the Great? I said, surprise, surprise. Some of our rulers in Malaysia claim descent from Alexander the Great. <laughs> yeah. The Parmeswara, who founded Melaka, claims descent from Alexander the Great. So Melaka's Daulat is from Alexander the Great. And in Perak today, there is a regalia, alat kebesaran, which is a sword called Chura Si Manjagini. And that is supposed to be the sword of Alexander the Great. So is in Malaysia, the Melaka from Alexander the Great, Perlis. Perlis Daulat came from Bangkok. In 1814, 1841, Bangkok. The Thais invaded Kedah in 1821, ruled Kedah for 20 years, and then went away. When they went away, they created Perlis as a separate kerajaan. So for many years, the ruler of Kedah used to go to Bangkok for to be for pertabalan. Yeah? So the Daulat is from Bangkok. And then our Johor, President Johor, in 1885, Abu Bakar was then Maharaja Abu Bakar was recognized by Queen Victoria as Sultan Abu Bakar. So the Daulat came from Queen Victoria. <laughs> Which is why when you go to Johor, you meet a ruler, you don't sembah, yeah? you bow. And ladies, if you have to be introduced by rulers, you can wear sarong, otherwise wear skirt. Don't wear trousers, because you have to curtsy. <laughs> In the University of Malaya one day, when the when Sultan Iskandar was young the Pertuan Agung, he came to visit the university, so all the Palapis people all uh, formed a procession in front of him, and some of them were given certificates. So they went up one by one. A few ladies went first, then one of the Indian officers followed. So all the ladies could see, could see, and this Indian officer, male, he saw all the ladies doing that. He was in trousers, he also could see. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you have to, and 
uh, in the case of uh, Joholamo, uh, the 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 uh, it was Malacca dynasty that created Joholamo, and then the dynasty ended in the famous story Sultan Mahmud Mangka di Julang. He was assassinated. Then his bendahara took over, and the bendahara became ruler. And that bendahara uh, appointed his own brother as the first ruler of Trungganu. Mm. And Trungganu later on appointed Long Yunus as the Raja of Kelantan. So Kelantan's Daulat came from Trungganu. And Daulat is very important. When there is no Daulat, there is no legitimacy. <laughs> See, they are quarreling today who came here first. The Malaysia we came first. The non Malaysia no orang actually came first. But it is not important who came first. What is important is who first established the Kerajaan. The orang actually had no Kerajaan. They were wild nomadic, nomadic group. No Daulat from anywhere. So Melaka was not the first kerajaan. Kedah was the first. And if you go by that, there need not be any argument. See how, interest, how important history is. So it took if you are interested in human capital, you must have human, human beings who are knowledgeable. Not just knowledgeable in the work they do, but knowledgeable in all that matter in life. And knowledgeable enough to be able to help this country achieve world-class in everything we do. Cukup. <laughs> Q&A. I must have Q&A. I want to know how you are thinking. <laughs> okay? Yep. So I'll go back there and you grill me then, okay? <laughs>